Welcome everyone to the MMA Vivid section with me, Zane Simon, and my co-host, Connor Rebish. We are back for UFC 220, going down this weekend in Boston, Massachusetts, headlined by two title fights, Stipe Miocic versus Francis Ngannou and Daniel Cormier versus Volkan Uzdemir. And, uh, okay, other than... John Volante versus Francis Marbahos, which I just I don't even know why you'd make that fight, let alone put it make people pay for it. As a main card for a pay-per-view. <laughs> yeah. Other than that, I like this card. Somebody tried to tell me last week, they were like, you know, oh, if it weren't for the top two fights on UFC 220, wouldn't you say that this like St. Louis fight card is better than UFC 220. It's like, okay, first you can't just remove the good parts of something and then claim it would then be bad because sure, everything yeah. works that way. Yeah, you, you cut all the best scenes out of They Live, and it's really not a very good. It's movie. not good. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> absolutely. Yeah, but, it's uh, um, this is like the standard UFC card going forward. I think is yeah. like you get. I mean, in this case, we're very fortunate. Uh, and I say fortunate because there does not seem to be any co cohesive design to making these things happen in the UFC. Yeah. It's been a huge complaint of mine for the last several months now. But we we are fortunate to have a truly like nail biting, interesting main event because yeah. we have this like, Tyson esque figure, McGregor esque figure in Francis Ngannou who comes out of nowhere and has obliterated people so thoroughly that he's not even been tested. So we don't even know what a lot of the ways in which Miocic might be able to test him. And so that is fascinating. But the rest of the card, I totally understand anyone looking at this, any average fight fan looking at this and saying, what the fuck? This card yeah. is completely weak because there's no, there's no narrative behind any of these fighters. There is not, there are no names that stand out. There are not, nothing that feels like it's going anywhere, but as is often the case, they're pretty much all perfectly matched fights. Uh, if you're looking for competitive action, there's very little to complain about on this card. But right. if you're looking for stories to come out of it, then I understand the criticisms. Yeah, I mean, the thing is, is just that outside of the uh, outside of the main and co-main, and I, outside of that one Volante Bahos fight, I mean, the, the UFC roster is five hundred and. 70 odd, 80 odd fighters deep you're not most fans just aren't going to know a lot of these people anymore and that seems to be a lot of the problem and but i mean like i'm excited for cater versus burgos and almeida versus font those are awesome fights mm -hmm. they are going to the give you the violence thrill you would want for from a pay-per-view they won't give you the name value but they are going to they're going to show up and be violent fights, no matter yeah, the real, what. The real problem is that, like, for example, fans don't know who Shane Burgos is still. Yeah. they And the UFC hasn't given them any reason to, except that he's been putting on phenomenal fights and looks amazing. And Calvin Kadar, huge upset, a very impressive UFC debut on short notice in his last fight, and yet just nobody knows. Like, that is its own problem, and it's not just because there's so many guys on the roster, like, any of us can That's still sit here. That's a big part of it, though. It's a yeah, big. Yeah, but any of us can still sit here and say, "Oh, Shane Burgos needs to be hyped because Shane Burgos is almost certainly going places." Sure. It, I mean, I they they could do a better job selling everyone, and they should, and they always should have. But that's the thing is that they always should have. Like that part of it has always been a problem. It's just it's more of a problem now that you have so many people, you sure. know, and yeah, so many cards. Help. Doesn't help. Yeah. So I, I, it's one of those things, UFC 220, it is not a name-filled fight card outside the top two fights, but I think, as you say, we're in an era where we're probably just not going to get name-filled fight cards anymore because you have 50 names and 50 events. Like, you know, that's, that's what the UFC has. They have 50, 50 to 100 fighters, everybody knows, and then they're going to put on 40 fight cards a year. And, you know, you just can't, you got to spread those people around as thin as you can. Yeah. Um, nonetheless, 
I'm looking forward to pretty much every fight on this card, um, except Volante Bahos, which is just going to be a shit show. <laughs> but uh, hopefully, it'll be an amazing shit show. Hopefully, it'll be an amazing shit show. I mean, Volante is guaranteed. Like, there's going to be some kind of meltdown in that fight. <laughs> yeah, there will be some sort of catastrophic failure in that bout. Have no doubt. But otherwise, there's not a, there's not a fight on this card that I'm just like. Oh, why am I going to have to watch that shit, you know? No, like I said, I'm quite interested in almost every single fight, but that only comes after I study footage. Yeah, well, that, that, get a feel that, for the yeah, getting to know the people is, like, that's what has to happen if it's not filled with names everybody, it, it, names yeah. you are immediately familiar with. Uh, let's start out, though, get down, get down to business, down to brass tacks with a Lightweight bout opening the fight pass prelims. Islam Makachev versus Glayson Tebow. Tebow making his return after a 26-month layoff, I think. He was suspended, popping for some kind of steroid. Drove Stan alone or something that sounds like that. Um, so curious to know how he looks uh, upon returning after such a long time away. He was already 32, I think, when he popped. He's 34 or 35 now. Tebow you know, super experienced, but how long can that last? We don't know. Also, has his potential supplement regime uh, regimen changed at all? Uh, will he look diminished having now popped for a steroid or will he look exactly the same? These questions are always present and, and rarely easy to answer until you actually see the fight. So we kind of have to just go off of what we've seen in the past, assuming T-Bow looks more or less like his old self. And fortunately, a lot of experience does help you in that regard of finding it easier to shake off ring rust. When yeah, and somebody with and such an established style, I would be yeah. pretty shocked if he, that just fell apart over a couple of years off, you know? Yeah, me too. I'm, I'm sort of expecting T-Bow to look more or less like himself, which means we get powerful wrestling, uh, we get nice and well-timed shots, but also strong clinch control, we get meat and potatoes boxing. T-Bow tends to kind of favor that left hand a lot, but... He's got a good jab to set it up, and he paces himself pretty well, just kind of picks his shots, um, likes to pressure a bit, but he's not too bad on the counter. And that lasts for about eight minutes, and that's a T-Bow fight. That has always been a T-Bow fight. He always loses the third round, which is why he always wins a split decision, because he always loses like this last half of the second round and the whole third round. But... Uh, He's still a really interesting challenge for Islam Makachev, who is a phenomenally technical grappler, uh, just a beautiful artistic ground player, but not a phenomenal athlete. If you want to imagine what his ground game looks like, kind of picture Khabib Nurmagomedov without the athleticism, without the ability to just rain down vicious punishment when he gets a con uh, position of control. And so Makachev is a lot more of a submission grappler than Nurmagomedov on the ground because that's really his most effective route to finishing people when he gets there. I think Makachev might be wise against T-Bow to maybe try to strike with him a little early, um, mostly because Makachev has a kicking game. And T-Bow didn't have much of a kicking game. Uh, Makachev is not a very smooth or clean striker. He's There's definitely some concerns about his chin after what happened to him against... Who was that who knocked him out? Oh, um... I'll find it real quick. Adriano no, Martins. Adriano Martins, yeah. Yeah, Adriano Martins. There's some concerns about his chin, certainly about his striking defense, but I think if he can make T-Bow work with kicks and just sort of stall off those earlier grappling exchanges, he'll have an easier time of creating exchanges that favor him as the fight goes on. But I'm by no means confident that he will be able to do that because T-Bow is a guy who will counter his uh, Makachev's great clinch and wrestling skills with equally impressive clinch and wrestling skills, plus a lot more physical strength. So T-Bow is going to be a lot to handle early on. I think Makachev will probably figure out a way to outgrapple him by the end of the fight, but it's going to be close. Yeah, um, I, I pretty much have to agree. I, my biggest feeling is honestly, even if like T-Bow does look more or less like him old self, his old self and does fight more or less like his old self, um, I do worry a bit about him being a little rusty and less able to just not having the timing to quite press the advantages he used to in the way he used to. And frankly, you know, maybe showing his age a little. I mean, that he's got to. 
it has to happen at some point. He's been fighting since 1999. <laughs> Only heavyweights last that long in the UFC. <laughs> yeah, this dude is 19 years into his MMA career now. Well, to be fair, it was the end of 1999, so he's 18 years Still, and change. He's, he's putting up those Vitor Belfort, Alistair Overeem kind of numbers that are not common at all below 205. Yeah, and, you know, when you say those two names, different <laughs> people who fail drug tests come to mind. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Yeah, although his advantage is, of course, that he probably does actually weigh more than 205, <laughs> and that's why he's been able to, true, to true. have such a long he career. He weighs like a heavyweight, so he ages like a heavyweight. Yeah. <laughs> um, I do worry a bit about, you know, at some point that's got to catch up, uh, even even if he's not that old. He's been, he's, he's been doing this for fucking ever. Uh, and the other thing is just that I think Makachev is... Fast enough. He's not, you know, he's not the world's best athlete. He's not Khabib. But he is fast enough to pursue his game on T-Bow in a way that other fighters haven't been able to. Mm -hmm. Similar fighters. Like I was looking back at like who's a really technical wrestler that has faced T-Bow and wrestles consistently on offense in a technical way. And couldn't win. And like the 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 only name that really stood out in there was Pat Healy, because like you know Peter Piotr Hallman, Norman Park, uh, Francisco Trinaldo, they're all not bad wrestlers, but they're not like the deepest technical guys in the world when it comes to their offensive wrestling. Yeah, not. and 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 frankly, like that is why I'm still concerned about Makachev. Like, uh, he does compare favorably in terms of speed and agility, but people who specialize in grappling don't tend to beat T-Bow. <laughs> like, yeah, remember, it is my big K word is that Khabib Nurmagomedov looked flat against T-Bow. He had a really yeah. hard time taking T-Bow down. Yeah, and so I am concerned about that. I just feel like if T-Bow is going to be off at all, if he, yeah. if we know he's going to fade down the stretch. And if Makachev can stay technical all fight and t is not very likely to hurt him bad enough to finish him, it's, I mean, t last knockout was Cal Uno in 2010. Yeah. <laughs> if all those things are going to happen, then I, I got to pick Makachev to take over just that little bit earlier to win yeah. the fight. Yeah, a slow start would be a very bad thing for T-Bow. So even if he's just the slightest bit rusty, that I think might be the window Makachev needs to to get the ball rolling sooner than most T-Bow opponents do. Indeed. Um, that, let's see, odds on that bout. Makachev is... The un is a favorite opened at minus 270. Odds have jumped up and down a bit on him, but evened out about minus 218 and are currently slowly sliding down to minus 238 now. So after adjusting upwards, they're now trickling back down towards minus 270 again. T Bow might be worth a look at those odds. Like, if he looks anything like the old T Bow, again, Makachev is like Nurmagomedov without the athletic ability. And people yeah. still remember the T Bow fight of Nurmagomedov's as a very close one. So, yeah. We'll and, and for T Bow, his odds are have pinged up and down. Started at plus 190, pinged up and down similarly, and have now are rising steadily back up to plus 193. Yeah, it feels a little odd, a little wide to me. Yeah, it, 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 there's a little bit of, I, I think there's a little bit of obvious recency bias where we've seen Makachev look good in recent fights against dudes that are powerful wrestler wrestler grapplers like Nick Lentz. And uh, we haven't seen T-Bow in a while, so it's easy to just be like, oh, well, Makachev's going to take this, never minding that he, you know, really out-techniqued Lentz early and got himself, he still got himself stuck in guillotines, but kind of had a, Forgiving style matchup in Lentz that made that a little easier on him early than it might have been otherwise. Mm 
Um, that brings us to a featherweight bout: Enrique Barzola versus Matt Bissett. And you no, know I'm on board for this one, Zane. <laughs> yeah, this is gonna be. Not only is it your boy Enrique, but this is just a really fun and funky style matchup mm-hmm. because Bissett is he is like a classic. East Coast regional scene action fighter mm-hmm. where he was molded, which means that he doesn't really wrestle, but he's got a really active ground game and a really active striking game without a lot of defense in it. And it's exactly the like, I mean, you know, and that's to say that the East Coast guys don't wrestle. We've certainly seen our share of guys rise up the ranks on the East Coast with a power wrestling game, charging through people, guys like Gregor Gillespie and Jared Gordon. Frankie um, Edgar didn't learn to box till he got to the UFC. So. Yeah, Frankie Edgar, too. But there's also this, like, very Andre Sukumta set of fighters out there that are just, like, tough dudes who scrap a lot and who have, like, fought a ton and only fight other tough dudes that scrap a lot. And they've got these really kind of cobbled together, fun, funky games that are like very diverse, but have these big skill holes that mean that they still lose like one out of every three fights, no matter mm-hmm. what. Yeah. And Bassett is very much that dude. Um, Barzola, on the other hand, has shown himself to just be a super high energy wrestler and he's coupled that with a very willing chin based striking game where he will just throw like he'll throw a lot of power high kicks a lot of winging hard strikes to get himself into takedowns get himself into body locks he's kind of like he's kind of like the peruvian um oh it'll come to me um darren elkins you know, yeah, that works. Or so like a, like a slightly more athletic Peruvian Charles Rosa. <laughs> yeah, it's weird, funky, cobbled together style, but it all works. Unlike the sets, I think, and en- Enrique Barzola's questionable technique all seems to fit very cohesively into a solid game. Yeah, and um, I'm split because I'm not sure. Just I'm still not sure just how good Barzola is. Mostly, he's just not a great athlete. He's not a bad athlete, but it's very much motor and toughness and then surprising technical ability that gets him through. Mm-hmm. Like People are like, oh, here's this tiny Peruvian guy who's just kind of like jiggling around and throwing big loopy strikes. And what's he going to do? And then he gets it on a takedown. It's actually like a really technical, powerful takedown and good ground and pound to follow it. And he'll just keep on people round after round doing that. Or if you get up, rinse and repeat. Rinse and repeat. Yeah. And my guess is that that is enough to beat Bassett just because Bassett does lack that wrestling midpoint. And he's a willing guard player even because of it. As a striker, he's the better striker than Barzola. We'll likely hit him hard. But we've seen like fights with Mogli Benitez that Barzola can just take a hell of a licking and go through walk through strikes to get his to get where he wants. And Bissett tends to actually when he gets in a firefight, he tends to get squared up and gets hit really hard and hurt pretty badly. I mean Halaba we saw recently knocked him out. But even in other regional fights, guys like Kevin Kroom and Joe Pingator lit him up early. And it was Bissett's own ability to rally and fight back from adversity and be the guy that keeps coming that got him through those fights. But you go back to when he was fighting like in Bellator and stuff like that, uh, fights with Scott Cleve and Daniel Veitchel, and... Guys who are willing to just get in and wrestle him and take him down and say, you know what, if you want to play a guard game, if you want to be on your back, I'll stay on top of you and I'll just work with it. They beat him. And I Barzola, I think that's Barzola. Like I just I don't see enough guarantee in Bissett's risk risky grappling game 
that says Bissett wins this off his back. And most of his submissions, his heel hook, guillotine, triangle choke, like he gets them. So it's definitely possible. But I think Barzola's high energy, t- more technical than expected top game, make the difference. Yeah, I, I tend to agree across the board there. Uh, I will say, I think I think Bissett does have some defensive skills, uh, but it, it only ever precedes an attack. Like the moment, Bissett is one of those fighters where the moment he starts attacking, he is just wide, wide open. Uh, he really, really favors that right hand, which I understand because it's a heavy shot and he hurts a lot of people with it, but he is a little too willing to just come in winging that right hand off of some of these nice slips early. Uh, Not only do I think that Barzola, I mean, A, Bissett does not have the same sort of nuance to his boxing game that somebody like Gabriel Benitez does. Benitez still had a razor close fight with Barzola and uh, the boxing alone was not enough to get it done. I don't think Bissett who really relies on an overhand right is going to be able to sneak shots through as well as Benitez did. Barzola is probably going to have an easier time timing him and avoiding that shot as the fight goes on. But then there is, there's definitely the kicking game of Barzola that I think will allow him to survive uh, and even do work on the feet in between those shots that he hits. And I do think he's, he's got a nice kicking game, very versatile, not a lot of power, but he will throw high. He'll throw to the body, side kicks, round kicks, spinning attacks. He'll mix it up and keep things interesting. A, I can see Bissette ducking into a head kick and hurting himself. The way he moves his head, the way he takes his eyes off his opponent when he tries to roll under shots. I could definitely see Barzola catching him doing that, but more important, you know, more to the point, I think it's just that Barzola will be able to force Bissette to come after him to get work done. And that is where those clean double leg takedowns come from. You work the guy over with kicks from range. He tries to close the distance desperately. You take him down and then you rinse and repeat. And I think that is what Barzola's win here is going to look like. Well, there's that. And there's also just the fact that Bissett, when he has to throw, when he wants to throw more than one strike, always squares his feet. Yeah. He always plants the other foot sideways, like side by side, and then starts winging punches which automatically put him in position to be taken down and to get hit harder because he's not bracing any of the shock. I think it's because he's so right hand happy. Like he, he'll throw the right hand, his, his back foot drags forward. Yep. Um, which, you know, forgivable. A lot of fighters do that. Not great technique, but then he just keeps throwing at the right hand. So now it's like a hook and he just keeps advancing feet square. Yeah. And, And then the, the other thing is that he's a guard puller. Like, he's confident enough in his grappling game that if he's getting tied up in the clinch and if somebody's trying to tie up with him and they're trying to muscle him around, they'll just dive for a leg. And so it it may not even, those two things, it may not even be incumbent on Barzola to shoot in on him especially well. Bissette will just say, oh, if you want to come in, if you want to clinch with me, if I'm squaring up and you're willing to walk forward, I'll just take this to the ground myself. And I don't, you know, I just, I have enough faith in Barzola's top game. It's the best part of his game. Yeah. That I'm not going to give Bissett the submission off your back edge because guys who submit, who work submission games off their backs just don't tend to do very well in the UFC. Um, I've done that fight. Barzola is the sizable favorite, opening minus 215 and slowly trending down to minus 225. Beset the underdog, opening at plus 165 and trending upward to plus 182. So, I'm okay with that. Yeah, I'm okay with that too. Not bad. Not, uh, but and so it's also short, really short notice for Bissett. So mm. I, I do think he can. He's got a good shot, especially to get a submission. Just because if that's the dynamic this fight's going to play out, he's shown the ability to get the heel hook, get the triangle, all that. Um, let's see what's Bissett by submission. That's plus seven twenty. So, and I mean that. 
especially when you consider that Barzola's, you know, the guys we're talking about Barzola being effective against are Chris Avila and like Gabe, G- Mogli Benitez and Horacio Gutierrez and Kyle Bochniak. Yeah. I mean, we don't Benitez. actually know how well he is at defending or how good he is at defending a real submission threat. Yeah, Benitez not bad from his back, but yeah, Bissett might be the most aggressive uh, submission hunter he's faced yet. So Aggressive and technical, so mm-hmm. that might be something worth a look, because it's a dynamic I could pretty easily see, and Bissett's not a great KO artist. Most of his knockouts have come late through acute attrition. The random early ones are pretty few and far between. All right, that brings us to Dan I or Dan EJ versus Julio Arce. Is that how it's pronounced? I thought it was EJ. Yeah, that's how they pronounced it on the Contender Series. Was it I would EJ or EJ? Ige, but it's EJ. Ige. Who would pronounce it Ige, Zane? <laughs> it looks like EJ to me. <laughs> yeah. Oh. Uh, the, more importantly, that this uh, setting aside any conversations about how to pronounce his actual last name, I do want to point out that even though Topology has his nickname as Dynamite, which totally fine, nice alliteration, pretty stock, but it's cool. Dynamite Dan Ige works. They were calling him Danimal on the Contender Series fight, and that is a brand of yogurts for children. <laughs> so <laughs> I don't know if Dan the Danimal Ige knows that, but it did crack me up when I first heard it. They're like, man, the Danimal going wild here. <laughs> I just pictured him he was in a fight with a go-gurt or something like that. <laughs> Julio oh. Go-gurt Arce, yeah. <laughs> yeah he needs, Julio needs to change his nickname quick, all right, for branding purposes. There we that go. go-gurt sponsorship. Ige looked really really strong on the contender series he's looked strong in fights before then as well i saw also i think his last fight in legacy he's a very confident aggressive wrestler his wrestling is the most impressive part of his game uh he's very very strong from the clinch that is i think where his wrestling really lives he can hit a reactive shot he can catch a kick or something like that he's he's good because he puts a ton of pressure once he's engaged in a takedown so if he's catching a kick, he doesn't have to quite get it. He will just run you off your feet while you're off balance and end up in a strong position. But in the clinch with the body lock uh, is where he does really, really well. He's got a great knee tap that he likes to hit from that position. He does a good job of reshooting once he's engaged. Nice takedowns from the rear waist cinch as well. Uh, and he does a good job of striking on breaks. It's actually something I've noticed that he does very consistently is he will look to throw a combination when he gets separation from the clinch tends to land clean and pretty hard uh striking prefers to pressure i wouldn't say there's a ton of nuance behind what uh, ige does but he's certainly game and willing to stand on the end of your range and hunt you down as long as he has you retreating he's pretty comfortable with the strikes because they lead into his wrestling and then on the ground very good positional control uh, he's, I've seen a few really nice slick back takes from him. Seems to have great control from that position. Even uh, just forgoing the hooks a lot of times and using butterflies from the back to kind of keep the legs elevated. Really cool stuff. Uh, it's going to be a clash of styles because Julio Arce is first and foremost, uh, my read on him, a boxer. The man likes to throw hands. Mm-hmm. And maybe a little shockingly hittable early uh, for somebody who carries that rep- reputation. But Arce has proven himself throughout his career, not just in his Dana, Dana White contender series fight, but before then to be a pretty effective adapter. Uh, if I recall his first fight with Brian Kelleher, who is of course the Brian Kelleher is the, uh, Oh man, what's the name of the guy <laughs> with the tiny blue underwear who fought in the UFC? Why am I blank? Dennis Hallman. Dennis Hallman. Yeah, yeah, Kelleher is the Dennis Holman to Arce's Matt Hughes. He just mm-hmm. can't beat him. The first time, close fight, got better down the stretch uh, as Kelleher, he sort of started to adjust, and then Kelleher submitted him instantly in the rematch, which is kind of what happened to Matt Hughes when he rematched Dennis Holman. I think that Arce is going to really, really want to pressure Ige here. He's going to have to watch out for reactive shots when he does, but really what he wants to avoid is being backed into the fence and allowing Ige to dictate terms in the clinch. If Arce can make Ige back up, which he may be able to do as the fight goes on, 
um, once the jab starts pumping, once he starts fainting and drawing things out of his opponents, his combination punches are just vicious. He puts his shots together really, really well, very accurate, got plenty of power in his hands to get the job done. Uh, but aside from that, I think he's probably going to spend a lot of time backing up and playing defense here before he gets the chance to adjust. I think that I, I see Ige really knowing that he needs to tie Arce up as much as possible in this fight. And I really think he has a technical edge as a wrestler from that position. I think that's going to carry him. But I think Arce is going to get super dangerous later in the fight as he keys in on Ige's striking. So incumbent upon Ige to make that wrestling happen early and often. But uh, he is my pick. I don't. I just maybe I am. Maybe I didn't watch enough tape on him. But my base read on Ige is that I don't trust that he has enough functional offense right now to yep. win, especially against a. A uh, pretty well schooled, pretty experienced volume striker like Arce. Mm -hmm. um, I just, you know, you you see the way EA strikes, and it's you know looking for these single big power shots, eating strikes in the meantime, some of which hurt him, um, and then you know trusting that he can get like wing his way into the clinch, and then in the clinch. Like, he's not a very damaging fighter. He will get takedowns and tie up and can do that well. Uh -huh. But there's not a lot of violent offense coming from him in the clinch. And on the ground, he's he's a little... Like, when he tries to open up, people tend to get up. You know? He can have good control, but it doesn't come with offense finishing offense and his record kind of bears that out like he just doesn't have very many finishes yeah. for a dude as powerfully built as he is and i think for for somebody like arce who is experienced enough to be able to scramble to be able to uh you know to be able to like limp out of things fight off takedowns as much as he can and who you know, he's not a great athlete, so he is going to get stuck. He's not the stronger athlete here. He's not a, a fantastic athlete, so he's going to get stuck in moments. But I think when he isn't stuck, he's going to be filling the rest of the fight with enough offense that he, I don't trust Ige to be able to match it for pace or variety or style. Yeah, it's yeah. very po possible that Ige, uh, in making Arce work and trying to keep the pressure on him early, wears himself out before he wears Arce out. Yeah, that Arce does come across as a very like calm and composed fighter. He seems to do well under pressure. Not that he can't be pressured to a loss, but it doesn't break him the way it does some other, you know, less. Yeah, and I, like having seen Iga get stung a couple times standing, where he, mm -hmm. he's gotten hit pretty hard. Arce is very much the kind of fighter who, if he hurts you a little, is going to start hurting you a lot. Like he Absolutely. will just open up and start pouring offense onto you. And I don't know that that's something that EA has even had to deal with yet in his career. Like, I don't know if that's an adversity that he's had to face. And so I'm not trusting him to be able to take it here. Fair enough. Um, Arce is the favorite. Opening at minus 180, adjusting up to minus 147. It's stayed pretty much there now at minus 151. Ige open at plus 140, adjusted down to plus 113, and uh, over to now plus 125. So I think that's fair. I, I mean, I think it's a, it's, a, it's a wrestling style matchup, style clash matchup that should favor Ige on paper, but Arce's, uh, his experience and his level of competition and his volume striking style i think he deserves to be favored even on short notice yeah i mean Arce is one of those guys that um those of us in the community have kind of been waiting to enter the ufc for a couple yeah. of years now at least so he's definitely not to be overlooked uh, that brings us to a flyweight bout dustin ortiz alexandra pantoja and this is going to be a fun fight this is going to be a fun fight especially because it's all all the questions here for me are with Pantoja. Like, 
you know exactly who Dustin Ortiz is and how he's going to show up. He is going to if if he gets except the for that, team, except for that last fight <laughs> where he just well, blitzed Hector Sandoval in fifteen seconds. That even I mean I, I I rewatched that and I was like, you know, there isn't anything about this that was new to Dustin Ortiz. No. No, it just he doesn't just, normally result in a knockout. <laughs> he just caught Sandoval perfectly. Like yeah. it's the same Dustin Ortiz who, given the opportunity, will drop into the pocket and be busy with his hands and throw tight, fast punches, but still get hit a lot, partially because his head's so big, partially just because he's never really fleshed out a striking style beyond being busy with your hands. <laughs> yeah. Sorry, that's not great for me being off camera, but no, <laughs> no, I, a sort I, of I, low I, punch defense. Yeah, um, but he's you know he he is generally tough. He will always be busy, and then he's a suffocating scrambler. And you tend to have to be either you either have to be able to scramble with him and outstrike him, or outscramble him to beat him you must match one of those. Like, you either must match or exceed his scrambling to beat Dustin Ortiz. Like, that kind of has to be what it is. And I don't know about Pantoja there. Because Pantoja, like, his striking style is going to lead exactly into what Dustin Ortiz wants. He probably could outpower and outstrike Dustin Ortiz if he wanted to play a patient pick you off at range be creative game but Pantoja is going to throw three strikes and wind up in the clinch because all of his offense is like this sort of tilt forward windmill to get you know that brings him inside and he will then get taken down or take you down whatever is acceptable to get into a scramble where he can try and turn the fight into something exciting and get a submission. Mm -hmm. And he's good at it. There's no question, but I don't think he's good enough at it to beat Dustin Ortiz. Like, you know, dudes that have really been able to make that work Jose Formiga, Wilson Hayes, Joseph Benavidez, they tend to be the cream of the crop. And guys even like Just, Justin Scoggins and Ray Borg have been on, and Zach Makovsky even, have been on the wrong side of making that happen. Mm -hmm. And I don't trust Pantoja to be, I, I, I just, I don't think Pantoja is athletic enough, honestly. Like, he seems like a dude who gets by a lot on just being unchecked in his aggression and being like, I'm going to be I'm gonna be more there than you are. And it gets him past fighter like Eric Shelton, whose game just wasn't that deep and who's kind of willing to get pushed a little, get pushed around a little. But it, I don't think it works against Ortiz, who you really have to, you have to be able to, consistently push him and consistently force a fight out of him that he's uncomfortable with. And I don't think Panjoja can do that. Like I say, I think if he could just keep it standing and kickbox Ortiz, Ortiz is hittable. He's hurtable. He is uh, mechanical, but Pantoja's sort of windmill style just leads him into the clinch too much for me to be com comfortable with that. And, I mean, it did for Moreno, too. But Moreno was also losing every minute of that fight until he caught Ortiz and choked him out. Yeah. Yeah, he was getting thoroughly controlled. And, I don't know, getting taken down four times by Eric Shelton. I don't have confidence, necessarily, even in Pantoja's yeah. ability to maintain a striking match, if that is what he yeah. wants to do. I think, really... You hit the nail on the head when you pointed to his athletic ability. Like I think that's what it comes down to. Pantoja has the guts and the uh, endurance of a phenomenal athlete. He will just keep doing his damn thing. Uh, the volume he put up in that Neil Siri fight and the pace that he fought at against a pace fighter was pretty impressive. But that's also Neil Siri, who is also not an athlete and is also like 39 years old. <laughs> 
uh, Dustin Ortiz is yeah he 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 I mean this is totally going to be the kind of fight where like it's all going Dustin Ortiz's way and then he just gets his back taken and gets choked out because that just seems like the kind of thing that'll happen even though it, like we don't have a pattern to suggest that it's just been always this bit of like weirdness to some of Dustin Ortiz's losses he kind of seems to kind of lose his head in the midst uh, when the fight slips out of his control yeah. where he's not edging the scrambles he can sense it and he kind of loses his edge a bit but uh, otherwise I just think he's gonna out wrestle Pantoja. I mean, I really just think he's going to be able to get those takedowns working, and and as long as he can't, as long as he doesn't get caught on the ground, then I think he's set. Yep. Ortiz, too much of an athlete. Pantoja is the favorite at the moment. Uh, opened at minus one fifty, adjusted down to minus one seventy nine. Has been rising ever since. Is now at minus one forty five, and uh, Ortiz, the underdog. Opened at plus 110, adjusted up to plus 140, and is now at plus 120. So, I'm really surprised that Ortiz is the underdog. Yeah, I mean, I think it's... You know, Antonio's kinda, got some momentum, but... Not that much. Yeah, and Ortiz is kind of established as a gatekeeper in this division. Yeah, I don't, I'm not really sure why that would be. Um, I guess it, the only thing I can think of is the, the Moreno fight, and that people have seen Ortiz lose enough, and they haven't seen Pantoja lose. So, um, yeah, otherwise, it seems like a very winnable fight, and I expect those odds to keep on closing. So, you know, if if you want to get in on Dustin Ortiz as an underdog, I wouldn't be surprised if that doesn't last that much longer. Mm -hmm. uh, that brings us to a welterweight bout, Abdul Razak Al-Hassan versus Sabah Hamasi. Bring this one back. Yeah, a fight we just we didn't see too long ago uh, at UFC 218 ended in a controversial TKO for Al Hassan, and is now then being rematched because it was such an obviously bad call at the time. Yeah, it was a kind of a weird thing where Hamasi took a shot off balance and dropped for a takedown, but then kind of got sp splashed by yeah. Al Hassan. So he ended up in this weird sprawled position. Herb Dean had a very off night that night. Um too frequent an occurrence it seems in the later days of Herb Dean's in the recent days of Herb Dean's ref and career, but it's still not easy to say who's going to win this freaking fight based on how it was going. <laughs> yeah. Like, when we I remember we had a hard time settling on someone the first time because like Al, Al Hassan only knows how to bang. And uh, Humasi is like too game to turn him down. <laughs> He's going to bang with him. Uh, my feeling is that with more experience, Humasi might actually have a bit of an edge this time around, that he may actually be able to make some adjustments. Al-Hassan may yet reveal himself to be a fighter who can make adjustments. We've not seen him rematch anybody and, and not really seen much from him in general. He's had such a brief career. But for the time being, he's kind of looked like the same guy each time out. He just goes out there, tries to muscle people, and just tries to bomb on them. And while he was in a good position to possibly end the fight when it was stopped uh, the first time, he, you know, he also got tagged a lot. You know, both guys were just beating each other. So, yeah. I, I don't know. I, I think I'm going to go on that very vague notion for Humasi this time. And I'm pretty sure I went for Al Hassan last time. So we'll keep things interesting. I think Al Hassan's going to come out brawling like it was the first fight. And maybe Humasi will have a little bit of. A little bit of cleverness to to pick the spots in between those big wild bombs of Al Hassan's. Yeah, it's tough because honestly, I mean, I think if you go moment by moment through that fight and look at just effective offense, Al Hassan had really very very little of it. Mm -hmm. A lot of effort, not a ton clean uh, of clean strikes. Yeah, a lot of stuff he threw landed on Hamasi's arms, landed on his elbows just didn't really catch anything clean, swung wild a lot. Homasi swung wild too, brawled too, but generally landed a lot cleaner and better throughout the fight. And I want to say that Al Hassan, the difference is Al Hassan took it better, but he didn't really. The stoppage wasn't because Al Hassan didn't take the strikes that landed on him well. It was just, you know, he got caught off balance, slipped and went for a takedown. And, Hamasi, rather. Or Hamasi, yeah. Yeah. 
he got caught off balance, slipped and went for a takedown, and the ref stepped in. And it's not a, it, you know, it was mere seconds after Al Hassan was like looking totally rocked and getting clipped and having his head snapped back. So you can't yeah. be like, oh, well, Al Hassan takes the shot better, you know? Yeah. For all we know, that was like the last salvo that Al Hassan was going to be able to gener- generate at that kind of intensity. Yeah. The biggest thing is honestly just because of Hamasi's cleaner technique, I have more faith that he can take a fight past the first round and still land his shots well. Yep. And that's enough to have me picking him here because I think he will be more cautious. I think he will be a little more technically set up. He might even try to wrestle a little bit more and better. Um, and Al Hassan is just going to go out and, you know, pour, pour his gas tank on himself, light it on fire and see if he can burn the place down before he, you know, he dies. Yeah. Still, still totally the kind of fight where Al Hassan might get a knockout at any moment in the first round, because like we can look at that exchange that ended the fight and it it wasn't, uh, it wasn't justifying a stoppage, but also, there's no reason that a crafty, experienced fighter like Homasi, you know, if we're lauding his experience, there's no reason for him, even in the first fight, to be standing with his back to the fence trading no. with Al-Hassan. So he's still going to be inviting a terrible end <laughs> throughout many moments of this first round. But Yeah, and, you know, there's even moments before that where he's, like, looking good, looking technical, landing the shots, slipping, all that. And then, you know, Al-Hassan clipped him behind the head with some wild leaping right hand and just like sent him to the canvas and he gets back up and he has to like recover and is, you know, in recovery mode and we get the brawl we had, but it's, it's hard to, it's almost impossible to call. I just, given the dynamics of the fight we saw, Homasi clearly had the clearer, the cleaner paths to victory, even if, not much. <laughs> yeah. It'll, it'll be fun again, though, I'm sure. It will. will. It'll be fun as shit again. No question. Uh, Al Hassan is currently coming in as the favorite. Opened at minus 315. Adjusted up to minus 240. Is now at minus 214. Slowly trending uh, upward. And Homasi opened at plus 235. Dropped down to plus 180. Is now down to plus 173. So those are slowly coming closer together they really should be close to dead even frankly i mean al Al hassan's strength of competition especially in wins is not anything to write home about and the only time he fought a good fighter he lost and homasi that fight is just its own weird thing i do want to say before we move on to the next one if al hassan is a good adjuster if he makes some changes based on the last fight, we may see a lot more clinching and, and chain takedowns for him because he did have some success just holding Homasi up against the fence and making him work. Maybe that's a way for him to prolong his gas tank in comparison to his opponents. We'll see. But um, could be, if Al Hassan is smart, it might be much less exciting than the first yeah. fight. It really, True. a lot of that is on him because his style up to this point has just been bonkers. <laughs> He's training with what team takedown these days? Which is he? Does yeah. that still exist? I thought team takedown was done. Maybe it was. I thought he was training with. Well, where, no. Where's Johnny Hendricks now? That's right. He's at Jackson's, isn't he? Yeah, I guess. Okay. Well, what, <laughs> I, he was training with team take team takedown. I have no idea where he's training now. So that's a good point. Um, probably should look that up, but I forgot they were done. Uh, brings us to a featherweight bout, Kyle Bochniak, Brandon Davis, and uh, this is also going to be a fun-ass fight. Mm-hmm. Um, Brandon Davis is the epitome of what Dana White loves in a prospect, or what he sees as a prospect, which is mostly a dude who is willing to forego all all ideas of defense and just stand in front of his opponent winging as much offense as possible. Yeah, I wouldn't say necessarily forgo all defense is fair, but definitely def- a defensive fighter in the Lando Venata mold, where yeah. defense 
truly only exists as an opportunity to land six punches <laughs> off yeah. of every slip. Uh, visually abandon all defense. Maybe, yeah. you know, there's a sense, there's a method to the madness. It's not devoid. It's like when co- people were talking about how, like, Cody Garbrandt just didn't have any defense early in his fighting career, and he still, like, it's like, well, yeah, but he hits you a lot harder, and having your, you know, if you're moving around well, then having your hands down and your chin out, it's still not great, but it's not the worst thing you can do. Mm-hmm. Um, Davis is very much in that mold. Doesn't quite have the power to him, but uh, a volume offensive juggernaut as a striker. And Botchniak is still kind of just a guy. <laughs> yeah. yeah, he's just kind of a guy. Like, he's a good athlete, and that's getting him through a lot. But he's not a great offensive wrestler. He's not a great grappler. He's a willing uh, defensive grappler, which is also not great for not being a great defensive wrestler. And as a striker, he's way too keyed in on single throwing single shots. Mm -hmm. He's keyed in on throwing single shots, in fact, to the point that he kind of tends to key eye on the ball. Holly Holm syndrome. Yeah. Where like but Holly Holm key eyes her way through combinations, which is actually <laughs> kind of impressive when you think. Uh, yeah, yeah, there's yeah. that. It's like ha 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 ha. <laughs> like, okay, I, I mean that's a little weird, but whatever. <laughs> but um Bochniak, you know, he'll throw like a long single jab that is like ha! Ha! Mm-hmm. Ha! <laughs> You're like, yeah, that that is not going to get you a long way, probably. It's not and a I, great sense of fluidity from his striking. And I think that that's honestly still the problem here, is that like, maybe he's a better athlete than Brandon Davis. He might be, he looks more powerful in general. Maybe he's a little more well-rounded, a um, little better wrestler, maybe, but he's not a way better wrestler. Um, and not having any combination striking really hurts you at some point like yeah and it hurts you especially when like Bosniak is mostly out there to strike with people you know he's he's not a great wrestler so that's mostly what he pursues if he ends up in the clinch he often just kind of gets like shut down back out to space and uh davis is going to fill all available space having defensive liabilities isn't that big a deal when your opponent isn't going to try to hit you that often. Right. So I get to land six strikes for every one that they land just because you respond the moment they hit you. Yeah. With six shots and they don't have anything else coming after that first one. Yeah. So that's really what it is. You know, if Botchniak, if I thought he could more thoroughly put Davis on his back and keep him there, then that he had a, he has a real path to victory that way, but I haven't seen enough of Kyle Bochniak dominant wrestler to make me feel like that happens. Yeah, for any uh, viewers who have not seen Brandon Davis's fight on the Contender Series, by the way, go watch it because it was <laughs> really really good. It was ex- insanely violent. I want to read to you because these are very very heavily. These are his his average numbers on fight metric, but these are really just the numbers from that one fight. Uh, Brandon Davis strikes landed per minute, 8.93. <laughs> on average, just based on one fight, he lands nine significant strikes per minute. It felt like more because, <laughs> yeah, the volume, like he really, it wasn't the cleanest work. You could criticize some of his his defense. I mean, mostly he was getting caught when he was attempting to throw in that fight, when he was yeah. actually waiting for the shot and defending, he was pretty hard to find. Yeah. He, he, he's slick. Like, you know, it, it, like I say, it, I think the Cody Garbrandt comparison without the power kind of works yeah. where it's just or like, like, he really reminded me of like Lando Venata without the power. Yeah. He didn't have all this, all the same spins and everything, all the, the really flashy yeah. shit. But if you're looking for somebody who's like bobbing and weaving with seriously in- aggressive intent, that's Brandon Davis. And yeah even more so than Lando, he 
did well because he put five or six punches behind each and each one of those aggressive jumps forward. If he would make you miss, he he just poured on the offense. And I yeah, I agree. I think volume is going to be huge in this fight. And Bakniak's again, that was just one Brandon Davis fight, but Bakniak's average over his UFC career, which by the way, could it be called a winless UFC career if that fight with Enrique Barzola had gone the other way? Because I thought Barzola won it. His average strikes landed per minute 2.58. So, yeah. I mean, that right there tells it paints a very clear picture of who these fighters are coming into this fight. I think Davis is going to overwhelm Bokniak with volume. And if it's anything like his fight on the contender show, he's going to start that overwhelming process very, very early. And he's going to start very, very aggressively. So, Interestingly, the odds on this are close to dead even. Bokniak opened at plus 145, has dropped, adjusted down to minus 102, and is currently at plus 102. Davis opened at minus 185, adjusted up to minus 132, and is now at minus 126. So, I would be kind of surprised if Bokniak won this. I mean, like... Yeah, stylistically, to, I just don't think it's show like a lot more than what he has shown to win this fight. And Davis only has to come in the same fighter to win. Like that's the way it seems to me. Yeah, I agree. I think, yeah, this this is one of the it's not like there's a, still a lot we don't know about Brandon Davis's potential, but I do feel like counter to that, we've seen enough of Kyle Bachniak to have a very good idea of where his limits are. And Davis's style seems like one of those hard limits that just that kind of volume, that kind of aggression, and that kind of variety and attack, too. I mean, let's not forget, Davis is going to be the taller man with a pretty strong clinch game. Uh, he's just got a lot of ways to continue piling up and diversifying that offensive output. And it doesn't look good for Kyle to me. Yeah, I mean, Bok you consider, too, like, you know, his career hasn't been very long, but Bokniak only has two knockouts and two submissions across nine fights and, and like as a chin we learned that <laughs> yeah for a young guy coming up like against regional competition if you're not finishing people then like there's just not enough offense in his game to be like oh well no he's got he's got that one punch power or that you know slick submission game that's just going to finish you whenever like we don't see, we haven't seen that yep and it's hard when you throw two and like two and a half strikes a minute. It is hard to get knockouts. Like it's hard to hurt somebody and follow up on it well enough if you're throwing at that kind of pace mm -hmm. to finish people. Yeah, no doubt. Uh, that brings us now to our pay per view card and a bantamweight bout: Thomas Almeida versus Rob Font. And this is you, I think. Yeah. Uh, this, as you mentioned at the top of the show. One of the more easily anticipated undercard fights here. I think mm -hmm. Almeida and Font match very, very well. A very attractive matchup between two dangerous strikers. Uh, I do think that Rob Font is going to hurt Tomas Almeida early. Uh, I think we have seen well, enough. Wow. In, into the crystal know, ball. Bold on prediction. That one. Bold. I'm really taking a, sticking my neck out with this prediction. Tomas <laughs> Almeida, not only does he have. The the problem that we've discussed many times of being not, not a terrible defensive fighter, but being very aggressive and so being there to be hit, he's in range. Um, and we know he gets better defensively as the fight goes on. He gets a read on what's what's happening in front of him. But I think we can safely say he doesn't have a great chin. He recovers well. Yeah, and, he recovers amazingly well. Yeah, and it doesn't seem to shake him mentally, really. Like, he 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 gets right back into the fight and just gets back to what he's doing. But... The man can be dropped, and it doesn't seem to take that much. Like, uh, I already said this on Heavy Hands this week, but uh, if you go back and watch Almeida's fight with Jimmy Rivera, which I recommend anyway because it was a really fun fight. Yeah. The two of them traded left hooks, and uh, Almeida got dropped in the first round. And if, I, if you showed me a freeze frame or just a slow motion lead up to the impact of the two punches, which landed at the exact same moment, I and told me one of these fighters goes down, I would have expected it to be Rivera because Almeida got, I think, the cleaner impact with his hook. It was a nice, short, compact punch. Seemed he had some weight into it. Didn't matter. Rivera ate that shit, and Almeida could not eat the less clean hook that he received in return. And that is a problem for him early. Rob Font has power in his hands. He's got yeah. long arms. 
Um, I think he's going to not have too much a hard time finding the target. But I do also think that Font is kind of one of those fighters who, um, I may say this about Calvin Cater later too, but he he kind of falls into these patterns with his striking. He kind of struggles to break out of this set tempo that he has. And uh, and when he does, it's like there's there's a little too much thought going into each thing, so then he can get caught out in exchanges. It takes some mental effort on his part to break out of just being like a one-two machine from long range. And Tomas Almeida is going to maintain that pressure. He's going to become harder to fit are harder to hit as the fight goes on. And he has a tremendous amount of variety to his offense. And I do want to highlight to um, something that I have never praised Almeida for, but Paul Felder made sure to, I think it was Paul Felder on the mic when uh, Almeida fought Rivera and pointed out that he is a phenomenally accurate striker, which he is. He, he, he really, really just has a great sense of his distance and where his targets lie when he throws a right hand down the pipe, it tends to land clean on the button. For somebody who tends to get hurt even when not hit clean, Almeida's counter to that is to be a very clean puncher himself. So I think Almeida is going to find his way into this fight as he so often does. And I don't think Rob Font has the wrestling, um, certainly not the top control, nor the variation in striking to keep him off down the stretch. Yeah, the, the biggest thing, honestly, to me, is what we saw, what we've seen from his from Font's losses to Lineker and Munhos is that I don't think Font takes getting hurt very well. Mm. Like I don't think he's he he doesn't have he doesn't have a great chin. It's not an amazing chin. It's not a bad chin though. It's. But when he gets tagged, I think his wheels start turning. Like where it's like, oh, you know, I got, I'm, I'm a little pa-. like that. That's not good. That's yeah. I got to make sure that doesn't happen again. You could see that in the Lineker fight, where Fox yeah. clearly had the right idea and did yeah. a lot of the right things, but just sort of started to crumble yep. under the pressure. And the thing is, is that that happened against Pedro Munoz too, where he like, mm-hmm. he starts out and he's nailing him with this jab and he's. Got you know he's showing all these good strikes, landing on Munoz at will, who is a a punch bag. You know Munoz is absolutely there to be hit by anything because his style is all based around stalking straight forward and throwing punches with shorter arms. Than you. Except for the predilection for pressure, he is the anti Almeida because yeah. the chin is phenomenally good. Yep. But the defense is not there at all. Yeah, and Munoz like he was just picking Munoz apart. But Munhos wouldn't go away, and suddenly Munhos, you know, kept stepping through and started landing a few jabs, started landing a few good shots that were solid. We know Munhos isn't a big power puncher, but he was landing. I mean, you know, he. It's just we've he's seen. He's not it. a knockout. Yeah, he's not a knockout artist. Uh, but he kept stepping through and landing solid shots on uh, Font, and started to hurt him a little. And when he started to hurt him a little, suddenly he started to punch him and hurt him a lot. Like yeah. Font became very reactive. Very reactive. Didn't see shots coming very well. And eventually got hurt and subbed out. Like mm-hmm. got clipped hard enough that he had to go for a desperation shot and got submitted. And he can't afford you can't afford to be that guy against Thomas Almeida. Like you either have to at that point you're saying, I either have to put this guy away immediately. Or I am going to crumble to his fight style. Yeah. And I think we've just seen that too much. I mean, the guys Font has beaten, uh, Douglas Silva de Andrade and Matt Schnell, um, or Joey Gomez and even George Roop. Like, you're looking at a combination of dudes who have terrible chins and don't recover in Schnell and Roop. And guys in Gomez and Silva de Andrade who just do not have deep enough striking games to make somebody like Font pay for his rhythm Mm -hmm. you know they can't break him and make him like even if they hurt him a little they can't then like continue to assert the same you know and put on offense that continues to hurt yeah and i think that um, i think the the munoz comparison is probably the strongest one because while the styles are going to look different 
Munoz kept, once he realized he could, he put the kind of pressure on Font that Almeida is going to put on him. He's not going to be like Lineker where he just like lunges after him, but he's going to keep walking him down. And better than either of those guys is Almeida at just keeping a steady output going, varying your shots and just continually hunting for the target as you push the other guy into retreat. Uh, all right. Odds on that fight. Font is – this one's basically dead even. Font opened at plus 135, dropped to plus 103, and is adjusted down to minus 105. Almeida opened at minus 175, adjusted up to minus 137, and has trended up to minus 118. I get why they're even. I get that Font has some power, and I know that Almeida has shown chinniness. But it's really hard for me to see Almeida walk through and do well down the stretch in that fight he had against Jimmy Rivera and say that Font is going to land bigger bombs and put him away better than than Rivera could. Mm -hmm. It does make me kind of sad just thinking about Tomas Almeida not having a great shin. Like, yeah. Why did he and Tom Dukenwa have to be cut from the exact same cloth? <laughs> <laughs> why couldn't we have this one crazy, aggressive Muay Thai pressure fighter who can take a really good shot? Because that, that is a pretty key ingredient for that style. But I don't think it'll be an issue here beyond the time he gets dropped in the first. Yeah, I mean, there will be a day for Thomas Almeida when um, that when like his not great chin will turn into a shit awful chin and his style will just disintegrate. Oh, that's when he'll become bantamweight Alistair Overeem and become a tricky outfighter. <laughs> Here we go. I mean, he is, honestly, I would even say, like, in the Rivera fight, while he got dropped, Rivera's got a ton of power. Um, he has been slowly crafting himself into somebody who doesn't take as many risks starting slow. Like, mm -hmm. he is trying to be that guy. Yeah, he still, I, I think, doesn't quite, uh, doesn't know exactly what he needs to be doing in those phases. Like, it doesn't really seem like he's establishing what's going to happen later in the fight. He's just... Yeah trying not to run into things but it's something yeah it's an effort and i appreciate that um that brings us then to a light heavyweight bout john volante versus francimar bahoj that brings us to the main event <laughs> <laughs> the future future depressed us material john volante um, versus francimar bahoj like this is this is me right <laughs> yeah this is me I'm um, so excited. I didn't even watch more tape on John Volante for this. <laughs> no. Like, why do you need to? Did I? No, I, I, I watched a few minutes on Franta Barba Hose just to refresh what exactly he's bad at. Um, <laughs> <laughs> but, like, you know exactly what John Volante is going to come out and do. And it's going to be throw the same punch kick combination for 15 minutes, entirely irrespective of what his opponent is doing. <laughs> you know exactly what John Volante is going to do, and it's not going to be learn. Yeah. He's not going to learn. <laughs> He's going to throw a mean left-right low kick or maybe left-right body kick. Keep things interesting. Yeah, keep things interesting. Mix it up. <laughs> and he's going to throw that for 15 minutes at the exact same pace and Ugh. until he gets tired well i mean it'll be the exact same pace in the it'll be one speed for two minutes and then it'll be a much slower speed of that for the next 13 we are assholes like the thing is okay just to i just feel compelled to say this because we do the whole show called the depressed where we essentially just laugh at bad fights but like John Volante is a star for that because he's so frustratingly incapable of adjustment in any way. Yeah. But fighting's hard, of course. Yeah. To all the people out there thinking this, John Volante would obliterate the both of us in oh, a God, split yeah. second. He would fucking crush me, and I would not do it. Even with the world class training, I'm sure I would never ever do as well as John Volante has done, no. even with all the right opportunities. But no. when you compare him to what the possibilities of elite MMA are, it is hard not to get some sort of sick pleasure out of it because he is just, he is made of meat and potatoes. <laughs> like there is no, 
there is no subtlety whatsoever to what John Volante does. He is just a smashing machine without thought. And it's great. I honestly love it. Like I get a, I get a huge amount of enjoyment out of John Volante's the, the fight. Dude, the borderline NFL, you know, borderline NFL talent. Like he is a marvelous athlete by the comparisons of most of us. Yeah, he just gets lit up <laughs> like yeah. every single time. Ugh. So on the flip side, Francis Marbohoz is exactly the guy who cannot take advantage of somebody who doesn't change speed. <laughs> I mean, you say that, but remember, Pat, like Pat Cummins outstruck John Volante for long stretches. I know, there. and I know. I mean, saying that he can't doesn't. I I am picking Francis Marbahos here. Oh yeah, yeah. Just because he his style won't get better, but it won't get worse either. You know. Yeah. He's I mean, just gonna he... come out and assert this same unilateral throw the occasional huge overhand or hard body kick, try to get you to the clinch, and stifle this fight to a crawl. And Volante doesn't have the speed change to stop that. I mean, and he's he gets Volante gets really tired in every fight, no matter how well he's doing. So yep. I'm picking Behoves, but mostly I'm just, you know, picking that we all lose and this fight should never have been on a pay-per-view. I can't believe that they're trying to make people pay for this. The thing is, if John Volante wins, like, it'll probably be, probably be good. And if yeah. Behoves wins, it'll probably be awful. Because, really, I think Behoves' path to victory well, here is to kind of mimic what Alir Latifi did. Mm-hmm. Like, be the better, be the better, more explosive takedown artist. And do that very infrequently, so that John yeah. Volante's John Volante's sluggish brain never catches on to it. But that means you're you are also just denying exchanges, yeah. just sort of making John Volante follow you around and just pecking at him. Honestly, I don't think Bahos has the composure to do it. Yeah, maybe. So I think Volante is going to catch him. Um, I think that Volante is one of the uh, undoubtedly solid aspects of his game is his takedown defense. He's, I mean, p- partly it helps that he's huge. He is really is like heavyweight sized. And yeah. he honestly might want to just consider going back to heavyweight because it's not like, as we said on the depressed us, people aren't really going to hit him that much softer at heavyweight and he won't have to cut any weight. So he might feel better. Who knows? But he's a big dude and difficult to take down from the outset. Pretty solid scrambler getting right back to his feet, especially if he gets uh, taken down by the cage. And other than that, like he does push the kind of pace that Bahos doesn't like. Uh, I think he can stay on Bahos, work those kicks, work that right hand. Bahos is gonna figure something out because nobody fights John Vellante for more than five minutes without keying in on absolutely everything he's trying to do. Yeah, but I don't know that Bahos actually has the striking credentials to respond in more than like single shots at a time. And in that regard, I think Vellante will have an edge on him in volume. So I'm going with John Vellante. Yeah, no, I mean, it could happen. It's been a while since Bahos has been knocked out, but oh, I don't think I'll knock him out. I think it'll yeah. it'll be an ugly, ugly decision by the end yeah, because see, that's what I said. If you're saying like, oh, Volante wins, it'll be fun. It could actually just be a it'll be fun terrible, for a <laughs> terrible split decision where Volante like landed three yeah. shots in every round that hurt Bahos and got nothing else done. In yeah, I mean, I think it'll start pretty fun. I think by yeah. the end, Volante's going to be real tired, but I just don't think Bahos has enough in the tank to capitalize on that. So It could be. It could be. This could be exactly the kind of fight that makes sure that dudes like Volante and Cummings stay somehow lodged in the top Hell 15 forever. Yeah. <laughs> Never leave us, John. Never leave us. Oh, God. What a terrible fight. Um, <laughs> I'm really I mean, looking forward to it now. The, oh, the odds. Um, everybody loses. Those are the odds. <laughs> um, the audience is uh, considered an underdog at plus 9,000 odds to enjoy yeah. the fight. Volante started at hyper optimistically at minus 215 and is up to minus 175 now after adjusting up to minus 180. And Bahos started at plus 165 and adjusted down to plus 153 and is now plus 146. So. 
whatever. Don't, don't <laughs> don't got no opinions for betters. Just yeah. Don't watch oh. it. And if you do, don't bet on it. Yeah. All right. That brings us to a featherweight bout. Calvin Cater, Shane Burgos. What a change of speed between the last fight and this one, huh? No kidding. This is me. Yeah, this is you. Man, okay, so this one you also tapped at the st- at the start as one of the undercard fights to watch. On heavy hands, we decided to talk about only two fights other than the main and co-main. They were Tomas Almeida, Rob Font, and Calvin Cater, Shane Burgos. I think this one, too, is going to be hot fire. Strong contender for fight of the night. Shane Burgos has been phenomenally exciting throughout his short UFC tenure so far. Um, he's had some close bouts. The one with Charles Rosa was kind of dicey, even though Rosa does not have much power. He was giving Burgos problems with volume and weirdness, just constantly staying out of reach, making him guess at what was coming next and just tapping away at whatever target was open. Rosa did a great job in that fight of taking what was given to him. And Burgos came across as kind of trying to force the fight that he's used to getting. So that is something that I think Calvin Cater could attempt to capitalize on. Cater has a nice long boxing game. He's uh, same camp as Rob Font, which is why I think I mentioned him before as having sort of a similar style. Mm-hmm. Uh, Mark Delagrati, I think, the boxing coach for both of those guys. Cater has a very nice jab. He's got a very nice one-two. And he does a good job. Uh, he has like a – I don't think he varies things particularly naturally. I don't think he's a super organic striker, just like Rob Font is. I think he has to think about making those changes in rhythm or changing those targets. But because of the way Mark Delagrati trains his fighters, he does have a bag of tricks. So uh, like one thing I noticed in his fight with uh, Andre Feely, Calvin Cater debuted on short notice and got a very impressive win. And I'm still very proud to this day of having picked him to win that fight for no real reason. It was a good show. Thank you. But Calvin Cater in that fight, um, he had a bit of a hard time early, and Mark Delagrati was like co- coaching him to use a specific setup kind of jab. He was like, I want you to use the skip jab, which from what I can gather is sort of hop stepping behind the jab to close distance and then coming through with the right hand. And it kept landing. And those are the kind of things that Cater was showing in that fight. They were rote moves. They were like, okay, now we're going to try uh, one, two, variation three B. Uh, they, they didn't just come out of organic feeling the flow of the fight, but he has a repertoire. He has a, a, a full array of uh, striking techniques. I do think that Burgos is going to read that kind of thing eventually, though. Burgos is, uh, we've already talked about Tomas Almeida not being a bad defensive fighter. Burgos is a very good defensive fighter for someone so aggressive. Yeah. He, he definitely still gets hit, but he is one of those fighters who very rarely gets hit clean. It's usually a glancing shot. He's usually rolling with it when he does take a shot. And otherwise, uh, as an aggressive fighter, he is a remarkably good counterpuncher because he loves to put that pressure on his opponents, make them throw, and then just nail them. And he's super confident with these low hands, chin hanging out, because he is very organic. Unlike Cater, knows exactly his sense of distance is, is superb and knows exactly where his head can go, how he can slot himself into different positions to take advantage of whatever his opponent throws at him and tends to get more predictable responses out of his opponents because of the pressure. So even if Cater has this full repertoire, ultimately I think he's going to be forced into throwing the same thing at least one too many times for Burgos not to catch on because you don't get to just think out all of your moves when you're fighting a guy like Burgos you are reacting to the man right in front of you. And he's always right in front of you, right on your tail. So I think it's going to be really dicey exchanges, but as the fight goes on, as is usually the case, I think Burgos is going to catch up to Cater, start hitting him with big shots, and uh, that'll sort of be what gets him a decision. Yeah, Burgos, one of the things that's interesting to me about Burgos, and it kind of threw me a little, is actually how much he throws, how much volume Mm -hmm. he throws. Yeah, that shocked me too. Looking at fight metric, I was like, five or six significant strikes per minute? Really? Yeah. Because like you you think about Burgos and you're like, oh yeah, he just kind of tends to pot shot a little. Like he'll mm-hmm. wait and he'll look for just trying to draw out just the right strike and then he'll land one. It's not really it. Like what he actually does is he tends to throw little shots and pressure behind little shots to get you to draw out offense that he can then pot shot behind. Mm-hmm. 
So the big strikes may be less frequent, but there's always a lot of offense there. Mm-hmm. And when you th- when he draws out one strike, he's likely to throw two. Yeah, and for somebody with that style, uh, we should also say like he did really well against Charles Rosa because Rosa, yeah. the way he fought that fight was kind of a nightmarish matchup because he just didn't give anything like fully committed, yeah. nothing that was like okay, here is when I land the big counter, and Burgos still found a way to make it happen. And, and that has actually, I think, one of the things that may unfortunately serve Cater for the worse in this fight is he may actually be a little too technical to Mm -hmm. fight Shane Burgos well. I know what you mean. Because, like, the thing with Burgos in his fights with, like, Godafredo Pepe and Charles Rosa, he got caught a little in each of them. Like, Pepe kept catching him with this wild winging right overhand. And Rosa's pretty much all just these, you know, wild kicking game. And they're really, like, unstructured and unpredictable. And for a guy who's relying on his ability to predict movement and have his hands down and just sort of, like, know when to step out and what moves to make and how to get out of a situation, he got tagged a bit for it. And Cater is going to come in being polished. Being like, no, I... Jab, double jab, 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 cross, you know, jab, cross, body kick, and all that. And I think that might actually serve Burgos a little better here. Mm-hmm. The big thing I think, though, is um, this is going to probably be a it, it, this will probably come down to being a tougher round one for Burgos than anything else, just because. I expect that Cater will try to assert himself as the pressure fighter to start. I think he would be wise to. Yeah, make yeah. make Burgos feel that pressure. And Cater is fast. And yep. even though somehow Burgos has longer arms than Cater, I think he's shorter but has a insanely long arms. Yeah. Cater does fight long and uh, can do a lot of good work if he's got someone on the end of his punches. So, yeah, I think he yeah. might. I, I think that would be very wise to just pump one twos, make Burgos back up and keep it on him for the first few minutes. Because Burgos, you know, he has to have pressure. He he wants pressure to fight as well, effectively. Yeah. He wants to be a pressure counterfighter. That's what he's looking for. And Cater is really almost entirely best served as a pure pressure fighter, as somebody moving forward, throwing combinations, just, you know, landing their own shots without giving space. Yeah. And I, I think, too, like, you, you hit on something there. Like, C- Cater, to me, is like a boxer puncher. That's what I would call him mm-hmm. if I had to name one of my favorite boxing-style archetypes. The question for somebody like Burgos, though, is, is he a counter puncher by nature, or is he a pressure fighter by nature? And I have a feeling he's a pressure fighter. Yeah. He, he, I think that the counters don't work as well without the pressure, rather than the other way around. I don't think he can counter as well off the back foot. So Cater having a little more flexibility to his style could make things really interesting if he pressures early because I think that like if Burgos ever ends up in a fight where he cannot begin to pressure his game might totally fall apart it might yeah so I'm, I'm really excited for this one I am too the, the the other thing that I would say too that kind of sways it it'll be an interesting flip side is that Cater is very into late round takedowns with good ground and pound mm-hmm. he doesn't really have a ground game but he is the kind of fighter who likes to try to throw somebody to the mat late and land a bunch of shots just to put a stamp on the round. Mm-hmm. Burgos isn't easy to take down, but he is willing to cede some control inside with the idea that he can just kind of slick his way out and find the better shots when he does, or he can make you work harder. And I don't know. So it's an, it's an edge to watch. Yeah, well, yeah, Bur- Burgos likes to let people kind of hang themselves. So yep. there's there's chances for Cater to to play with that. That uh... yeah, I'm I'm picking Burgos, but I I I think it could the first round is going to set so much of the rest of the tone for this fight because yeah. that's the other thing. The other other thing, one final other, is that Calvin Cater is tough as shit. Mm. The dude is fucking hard as nails he has never been knocked out and 
what we saw in the Feely fight a lot was Feely trying to get him back him off and just getting hit harder and not being able to like cater just walking him down, walking through yeah. it. So I mean, Burgos is tough as hell too. We have seen dudes try to tee off on Burgos, try to make him pay for walking them down, but this is really going to be a fight about two do- two guys trying to assert a pressure game early and seeing whose pressure game wins out. And mm-hmm. I think it's Burgos just because Caters is a little more mechanical, a little more predictable, but there are no guarantees. Yeah. Can't wait, man. Love this one. I love that fight. Um, Calvin Cater is the underdog opening at plus 185, adjusted down to plus 138, uh, dipped down and... Uh, down to plus 109 at one point and has risen back up and is going trending up to plus 154 at the moment. So those odds got a lot narrower and have widened since. Burgos opened at plus or minus 265, trended up to minus 133, and are dropping back down now at minus 184. Um I feel like this could be a little closer, honestly. I really do feel like I'm not like I I I trust Burgos's style more. I trust his active defense more. Cater is more hittable. And I'd like Burgos's output, but there's going to be it, it's an interesting st- thing that you look at the guys that Shane Burgos has fought. Tiago Trator, Charles Rosa, and Godfredo Pepe. And none of them come close to mirroring what Calvin Cater is going to try to do. No, and they're and they're kind of um, fighters who don't really have any freedom of choice in how they fight Shane Burgos. Like whether through their own limitations, like Charles Rosa had to fight Shane Burgos the way he fought him. Godfredo Pepe couldn't fight Shane yeah. Burgos any other way than the way he fought him. Calvin Cater is the first opponent we've seen in the UFC on Burgos's level who has like a, a lot seems to have a lot of tactical flexibility to his game. So, and you can even say too, in the Tiago Trator fight, like Burgos, you know, he brutalized Trator early in that fight, but when it got late and Trator just was like, well, I either get knocked out or I just keep asserting myself and going forward. He had a lot of success. He landed a lot of shots on Burgos. Yeah. Still got Burgo still got the better of it, still won the fight, but Trator isn't a powerful striker, isn't a big featherweight. And Cater is not like Cater's not that hard a hitter. He doesn't have a ton of knockouts, but he's definitely a lot bigger and more powerful. And he has the he has the balls to commit. He will yep. step into a shot. Like he he was going after Andre Feely in that fight. Yep. Know? That counts. It's going to be a fascinating one. Yeah. That brings us now to the co-main event light heavyweight bout, Daniel Cormier, Volkan Uzdemir. And um, how do we end up here, Zane? <laughs> Volkan Uzdemir. Remember how we laughed? Oh, how we laughed when he, fought, oh, when he fought open St. Peru. <laughs> oh, how we laughed. Volkan, I remember when you I first... Tools of us all. <laughs> when I first heard of Uzdemir, I remember I was like... Uh, all right, well, who, look, look at his Wikipedia, and it may have been with you, but I, I think it was. I recall us cracking up because his Wikipedia was devoid of information except for the fact that he was Swiss. <laughs> and I, that just made me laugh so hard because he just seemed like such a non-entity. And yet, here we are. Here Top we are. contender, Vulcan Uzdemir. So I, I was talking about this the other day, and I can't remember what the fight was it was in reference to now. But it was about MMA clinch games and how... You were talking about Loma Lukbunmi, right? Yeah, that's right. I was talking about Loma Lukbunmi over in Invicta. Invictus 27. And how so many fighters view the clinch as a safety valve in MMA. It's the place where they're like, well, I, I trust the, you know, I'm the biggest, strongest guy in my gym. So when I clinch people in the gym, Are you I can just lock them down and that's my safety valve for if I'm getting tagged on the inside or 
if I'm not comfortable in the pocket, I can throw two strikes, get into the pocket, and then before I have to eat anything, lock down my opponent in the clinch, slow down the fight, figure out what I want to do next. And that's how a lot of fighters see the clinch. You know, it is an opportunity to grind and to assert a physical grind. Yeah. And it means that when they meet fighters that don't view the clinch that way, that are better in the clinch than them, they get lit the fuck up and they cannot help themselves in getting lit the fuck up. Yeah. And I think it's worth making the small, some argument that um, Volkan Uzdemir's UFC success is in part due to that fact. Mm -hmm. He's found this little gap in the general metagame of his opponents where they're looking to rest and he's just looking to do damage in close. Because Uzdemir moving forward is not a very good striker. When he is, when he has to chase somebody and throw punches, he tends to either just spam like power kicks over and over, or he tends to reach way out with big looping shots that, while powerful, leave him brutally exposed. Yeah, like he keeps his he keeps his feet under him. That's why I think he maintains his power. But they're also square. Yeah. And it doesn't tend to move his head a lot. So, yeah, he's... I mean, Ovin St. Pru in their fight, every time uh, that Ozdemir would actually run after OSP and chase him with big strikes, OSP got hit a little, but oftentimes he would square up and counter, and he hit Ozdemir hard a lot coming in, just because Ozdemir would come in so squared up, so chasing, and puts himself out to get hit. The other part of that is that Ozdemir is also not a very good counterfighter. He's, in fact, a bad counterpuncher. Um, he's a better counterpuncher when he's tired, actually, because he no longer has the time to think about, the ability to think about being defensive and active defensively. So he just will, like, get hit and then throw a body shot in in tight but especially early in fights ozdemir's defense is a high forearm guard it is a double forearm guard yeah and one of the reasons that i don't like to see a double forearm guard in mma is that it basically just says i am not going to be a counter puncher at all in this exchange it also says pertinent for this matchup please take me down yeah it says take me down it says find a way to to angle your shots around my guard. You basically just do what you want because it's yeah. like I it, it says I'm just defending punches to the head. Yep. All right. I'm blocking. So do whatever you want that isn't a straight shot into my arms. And that's how Uzdemir defends, you know? That's how he defended against Misha Serkinov when Serkinov ran at him. That's how he defends when Jimmy Man against Jimmy Manoa when Jimmy Manoa came at him. That is just how he defends. And the key the big difference has been in the clinch. When Uzdemir, you know, he a lot of why he chases with his strikes and is willing to, like, run forward behind big shots is that he wants to clinch up. He wants you to be forced to clinch up with him, and he, or he wants to clinch up with you. Either way, he doesn't care. And he doesn't really care about control either because he sees the clinch as an opportunity to create offense. That's where he's comfortable when he has a hand on somebody and can land punches. And he, you know, absolutely shocked Misha Serkinov with a shot up against the fence as Serkinov ran into him. And he circled off. It wasn't a counter shot. Like, Uzdemir, they had to get back into the fence, circle out, and then find that shot afterward. It wasn't just like a stepping back, like, oh, I've landed this perfect hook as you're chasing me. No, it was a complete, like, dog shit version of what Stipe did to Fabrizio Verdun. Yeah. <laughs> just just kind of mush the inside of your fist <laughs> against the back of someone's ear, and they're just dead. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> and against Manawa, Manawa run, you know, clinches up with Ustamir and is just treats it like this 
in this this intersectional little like rest break. Like, oh, I'm gonna clinch you and hold you against the cage, and then I'm gonna figure out what I'm gonna do next. And it's like, okay, I'm just gonna punch you in the head. You know? Problem solved, yeah. Thing is, is that Daniel Cormier is infinite clinch fighting. <laughs> like he is one of the most productive clinch fighters out there. Bar only John Jones, and even against John Jones, a lot of what happened in that fight was Cormier dropping a ton of fights or a ton of shots on John Jones and getting like he would get lit up on his way into the clinch, land four or five really hard shots, and then John Jones would muscle him into a different position or get a takedown or do something that John Jones does that's miraculous and rare. And otherwise, like, a lot of their clinch exchanges were really equal up to that mm-hmm. point. Like, and other, you know, you get Anthony Johnson trying to clinch with Cormier and getting lit up. And you get just basically any fighter who has tried to tie up and just figure out Cormier inside pays for it. Yeah, not even just lit up, like... If you try to light Cormier up in the clinch and you're not John Jones, you're probably getting taken down. Yeah. Because the moment you start working on something else, like that is really what he wants to do. In the exactly. Clinch, get a hold of your legs. And um, so Ozdemir not being good on the counter means in part, like the big thing is that the biggest opportunity for Ozdemir is that Cormier can still be found by a pursuing striker who's willing to just get wild and go after him his defense and his movement looked a lot sharper in the john jones fight than any fight before it but you know you just have to go back to the anthony johnson fight right before that where johnson tried to out wrestle daniel cormier for god knows what reason after but after cormier displayed both his suspect defense and certainly not suspect chin ducking into a rumble head kick nose first yeah he yeah, got out by that shit cuz yeah like in, in the brief seconds that johnson was willing to work at range at all he hit cormier hard just mm-hmm. by being willing to throw a bunch of shit and cormier's predictable ducking to his right side yeah <laughs> um but that's a really narrow window. Like that is a window for everybody for only John Jones and everybody else has failed to find it entirely. And Uzdemir is just like the limits of a guy who's not very good going forward, not very good going backward and really only at his most comfortable when he's tied up with you body to body. Just do not paint the picture of a guy who beats Daniel Cormier. Yeah, it's hard to disagree. I said uh, I said this uh, on heavy hands, but the di- the difference between this and the main event is kind of striking as a matchup with some kind of narrative appeal. Because like I know almost as little about Volkan Uzdemir as I feel I do about Francis and Ganu. But whereas Francis and Ganu feels so compelling because I have so many questions still about where he might go and what might his strengths and weaknesses really be that we haven't seen yet. With Fukuoka Nishimura, I, I I just don't have any questions. <laughs> I just feel like I know everything that I need to know, and I just feel like I don't care about the rest <laughs> because his game is so weirdly flat that it's still so bizarre to me that it's been so effective in the UFC. He's yeah. not a bad fighter. No, He's, he he seems to be very physically strong. I mean, that's one thing. Yeah. Aside from having punching power, I do think he's a he's really quite hard to overpower in the clinch. It mm-hmm. could make this interesting if he's really that strong and maybe Cormier, I don't know, a little shaky. That could be interesting. Uzdemir is fairly technical in flashes as a striker. He he at least has a very respectable kicking game. Seems to be very dexterous for a man his size with both mm-hmm. legs, quite dexterous. And yeah, fighting in those transitions in the clinch, at least what other people think are like just transitional positions are to Uzdemir a big part of his game. And so he has those things going for him. But... He's also just kind of like a guy. <laughs> like he he doesn't I did nothing nothing that there's nothing that screams out to be uh to be remembered from a Vulcan Uzdemir fight. Like there's nothing that, that says like this is his game. He's making the other man fight his game and this is what he's good at. 
So yeah. I've watched all of his UFC performances a few times each. It's easy to get through the last two because they're so quick. And yet, just like, uh, what's he good at? Which isn't, that's not the question I want to have. It's certainly not the fresh questions I have about Francis and Ganu. I know yeah. what he's good at. Uh, and I'm still not really sure like what Uzdemir's path to victory over somebody like Daniel Cormier could possibly look like because the clinch doesn't favor him because even though, yeah, he's got a respectable takedown defense uh, and he's actually quite good in top position, Vulcan Uzdemir, yeah. he's pretty dangerous if he gets on top of you, but that's not going to happen. Yeah. Uh, takedown defense, like, yeah, Alexander gustafson has got great takedown defense too. He got taken down by Daniel Cormier. So does everybody. Uh, and Aside from that, Cormier is just a very, very he, – he absolutely has – you could even say he has as many holes in his game as a fighter like Vulcan Uzdemir. Like, there are plenty of th things you can point to as these are weaknesses of Daniel Cormier's. His defense isn't great. His feet get out of position when he's coming forward. Uh, you know, you can point to all these things, but they just work as a game. They mm -hmm. work as a whole stylistic framework. And with Uzdemir, it just still feels like he's just stumbling dick first into all of his wins. <laughs> like, it just kind of feels like they just happen. Maybe that's me just catastrophically underestimating Vulcan Uzdemir, but... Well, I, I think the big thing really is just that inter that intersectional offense thing and the fact that MMA above 170 pounds is a different game than it is below 170 pounds. And there are still yeah. plenty of fighters in middleweight through heavyweight who just are... You know, doing playing the sport like it's 2005, like or 2010. You know, it's sort of like, well, we've got the punching part, and we've got the wrestling part, and we've got the grappling part, and occasionally, you know, like, oh, you know, somebody landed some knees in the clinch. Oh my God, what is this? Like, <laughs> yeah. But no one ever accused Daniel Cormier of being uh, lost in transitions. He's no. quite good in transitions, and so. It's just like Daniel Cormier all the way. <laughs> yeah. It's it's gotta be. Odds on that fight. Cormier, a pretty reasonable, a pretty sizable favorite. Not huge, but uh open at minus three eighty, adjusted up to minus two eighty, and is trickled back down to minus three thirty four. And Uzdemir opened at plus two sixty, dropped down to plus two forty or so, two thirty, and has risen back up now to plus two sixty six. Kind of feel like this is the whole like we've gotten so tired of putting long odds on Vulcan Uzdemir that we just can't afford to do it anymore. <laughs> yeah, we've lost too much money, so just make it close odds, and we'll take a small loss this time. Because <laughs> it does feel like it, it, it's a terrible style matchup for him, but I guess <laughs> he's probably going to win. Yeah, he's probably, probably going to be champion in perpetuity after this. He's just never going to lose because everyone's going to get booped 30 seconds into the fight with him. <laughs> Can't wait. Indeed. All right. Speaking of guys booping with power. <laughs> Boop is not how I would describe the kind of knockouts that Francis and Ganu has been delivering. I would say, bomb, really? Yeah. <laughs> unkind to the deceased in the like such as Alistair Overeem to call what happened to him a boom. <laughs> it was a boom. Okay, a boom. There you go. Um Francis Ngannou, Steve Amiochich, our main event heavyweight title fight. Break it down. How how long has it been? I mean, I don't know. I don't want to assume you're feeling the same way I am, but how long has it been since you've been this excited for a heavyweight title fight? It's been I'm a minute. Right, it's Honestly. been a while. Like heavyweight, heavyweight to anyone who's in the know just kind of sucks. Uh, like MMA fans know this that heavyweight fights are not a reliable source of entertainment. And I am hyped for this, and it doesn't mean it couldn't end up sucking. You know what it was? Huh. 2015, Fabrizio Verdum, Kane Velasquez. Yeah, that's it. But you know, like if Steve Miocic is going to get his record-breaking third consecutive title defense. What an event to to yeah. build him as a, as a future star uh, if he gets a win over Nganu because everybody is interested in, in Nganu because he's just been myrtleizing people. Um, there are, as I said in the last part, as I said earlier this week on Heavy Hands, there are so many questions I still have about Francis Nganu. In fact, that's kind of the basis of the article I'm writing about him right now. Like, can you do this? Can you do that? How does he respond when this happens? Don't know. Um, 
all we know about Francis Ngannou is what limited amount we've been able to see because people just keep getting killed by him uh, really, really quickly. Yeah. I suspect that Francis Ngannou does not have the gas tank to fight more than three rounds at the pace that Stipe Miocic will prefer. Um, Miocic will get tired too. He is also a heavyweight, yeah. just as he did in the Junior Dos Santos fight, just as he did in the Mark Hunt fight, even when he was completely having his way by the end. He gets worn out, but he's very comfortable with that. That's kind of the wrestler's uh, place of comfort is, is being uncomfortable. So I have no doubt that if this goes past the second round, it's Stipe Miocic's fight. Uh, I think it's if it goes past the first round, his odds go up drastically. Yeah. Uh, because, you know, like all we've seen of Nganu outside the first was the fight with Curtis Blades and the fight with Luis Enrique. And in both of those, much earlier in his career, he does seem to have made huge leaps and bounds and gotten more comfortable since. But in both of those, he was visibly slowed uh, at the time that he finished those fights. Very, very, the bounce was not there in his step. His punches still had plenty of power, but he was laboring to make them, to, to bring them to bear. And so that's a concern. Can Francis Ngannou fight off of his back? If Stipe Miocic does get him down and, and is able to hold him there? I don't know. Like he might be strong enough to just bench press a dude off of him. But again, those are tactics that will mean he will slow down. So maybe it's to Stipe's advantage to just ask those questions again and again and again and just force Nganu to just boldly respond because it's quite possible. Nganu is one of those guys who looks like like an, a, a natural for MMA. He mm -hmm. just seems to get it. The way that he moves into his punches, the, the accuracy he has for such an inexperienced fighter, how quickly he has gone from being um, a phenomenal athlete with a pretty piecemeal game to being a fighter who enters the cage each time looking ex like he knows exactly what he wants to do to his opponent. Um, like nothing, nothing underscores that to me more than the Alistair Overeem fight. Mm -hmm. Where Ngannou just... He knew what Overeem wanted to do to him. He went in there. He drew some things out. He's like, all right, he's going to try to counter me. I'm just going to counter his counter. And it was like the first time he did it, he killed him. <laughs> the first time. He knew it was coming, and he just murdered him for it. And like that's the thing. is, It makes picking a fight like this pretty difficult because Nganu does have that Mike Tyson, Conor McGregor sort of aura about him where he's he's got so much... I can't even call it unearned confidence. It's earned because oh, yeah. nobody's been able to stand up to him. And so he enters the cage now with this sort of aura where it, it's kind of like naivete in a way. Like there's still so much I'm sure he doesn't know, but he can benefit from that by just, he doesn't know what he doesn't know yet. He's just learning new things and then easily applying them in his fights up to this point. So it's like, I think he'll come out extremely confident and, and much as he did against Overeem. And, that's why I think the first round is going to be excessively dangerous for Stipe Miocic. Uh, people have pointed out, Pat and I on, on Heavy Hands talked about Miocic wanting to sort of maintain his distance, interrupt, deny Nganu the chance to counter. Because I really think the heart and soul of Nganu's game is his counter punching. It's going to be that going forward. That seems to be just what he naturally gravitates towards is drawing you out, wait for you to commit to something big, and then take your head off. And there are two ways of stopping that. Miocic can be all the way in, or he can be all the way out. And if he's all the way out, it's got to be feints, it's got to be jabs, it's got to be kicks, it's got to be non-committal stuff that just interrupts Nganu's intentions, forces him to load up without letting him release uh, until he starts to slow down. Or it's all the way in, where it's Miocic throwing these short, tight combinations in the pocket. Many people have said that's how Miocic is going to deal with Nganu. And I think it's going to be so dangerous getting to that place because, yes, Miocic delivers power in, over short distances. He's super confident in his combinations, and I have no idea what Nganu looks like in the in the phone booth. Like a, in the pocket, he's a beast, but I have no idea what he looks like on the inside, other than the brief clinch exchanges we've seen from him in other fights. But getting there without Nganu adjusting, without Nganu taking one of those angles or creating a little space for the uppercut, without Nganu hitting you on the way in, is going to be so dangerous for Miocic that um, I think it's basically like a two-true outcome fight where it's like Nganu just obliterates Miocic early, 
Uh, well, we'll say three true outcomes because it's also very possible Miochis obliterates Nganu. Yeah. Uh, we don't really know how good Nganu's chin is, and Miochis hits like a fucking tank. So, th three true outcomes. Nganu obliterates Stipe Miocic in the first round, uh, possibly the second, if he gets the kind of fight he wants. Or Miocic returns the favor or beats him down the stretch with pressure, with wrestling, with a consistent attack. And I think it's about a 50% chance the first one happens. And so I'm going to pick Nganu. But the fight's going to change drastically it, whether or not that happens in the first round. And like th this could go so quickly from being a Francis Nganu fight to being a clear Stipe Miocic fight. I just don't know how Nganu responds. No idea. Yeah, I am I'm going to pick conservative this one time. <laughs> And I'm going to go with Stipe Miocic. And it's not for a disbelief in the hype of Francis Ngannou. Because people are like, you know, there are people out there who are like, oh my god, you know, UFC is selling Ngannou on this hype train and people are buying it. Like, he's this unbelievable whatever, yada, yada, yada. No, the dude is clearly something special. He is unbelievable. Just fucking yeah. look at him. Jesus Christ. People are such downers, Zane. They can't they get are, any hype but, trains. And there are, you know, one of the biggest challenges that keeps me coming back for me to wanting to pick Nganu is that Miocic's defense Miocic's defense is not good. No. It's really not. He he is a he is a fighter who lives off of his offense. Yeah. And you know he like he got rocked by Alistair Overeem and had to come back. He got uh oh I'm trying to remember what was the there's another fight he was hurt. Santos anyway. dropped him. Yeah. Stefan Stroop knocked him out back in the day. Well, yeah. But, like, it's just... And, yeah. O Overeem, Dos Santos, Stroop. Those are the ones who have really badly hurt him. Yeah. And, and he's willing And he is willing to take those punches. Like, even, you know, JDS in their rematch, that's like, everybody remembers that it's this super dominant, super great Miocic fight. I was rewatching. I can see why Junior Dos Santos thought he was doing everything right in that fight. If you go back and rewatch it, because like he's landing hard leg kicks, he's actually landing the better shots on Miocic for like the first two or three minutes. It's just he keeps backing himself into the fence over and over and over again. And every time he does, Miocic fires off and eventually caught him and hurt him. I mean, it's kind of funny, right? Like for as ridiculous as Verdum looked. Um, where he had like two minutes of kickboxing and then just decided to chase Stipe Miocic, follow him into hell and beyond, that that is exactly the turn Miocic has kind of hit in his last two fights, <laughs> where it's been like this dicey kickboxing match, and he just, just decides to run them down. Yeah. And that's so, as he showed against Verdum. There are vulnerabilities to that. And I, was even, I even went back to his hunt fight, because the other thing I wanted to do is like I wanted to find like, it's the only one I could find recently. It was like, where's a fight that Miocic just did not want to kickbox? Mm -hmm. Really? You know? Where does that fight exist? And it's the Mark Hunt fight. And he spends, still spends a large part of each round kickboxing with Mark Hunt. Still gets hit a lot. Hits Mark Hunt a lot, too. Um... The interesting thing that that showed me as well is that a lot of the baseline for what Stipe Miocic does as a wrestler is really comes off his single leg. Yeah. Like he reaches for the single and then he runs the pipe on it or he turns that into the double. He's not going to like power through a big double leg takedown just out of nowhere. It's not tends not to be how he fights. If he's going for the single, he's just going to, or if he's going for a takedown, he's just going to like reach down and snatch it kind of thing. And the weird thing is that, like, I've never seen anybody do that to Francis Ngannou. The he only way. Not know how to respond. The only way that Francis Ngannou has ever been taken down is somebody running through him. It's yeah. Curtis Blades or, uh, Luis Enrique. Luis Enrique just deciding, fuck it, I'm just going to throw my entire body at this dude and we'll see if he can stop me. Mm -hmm. And those are the two times he's been taken down. 
And the bad what if, look. Like, how funny would it be if Ngani was just like James Tony? You know how Randy Couture was <laughs> like, well, he's probably worked on defending the double, so I'm just going to hit a single and in the hopes that he won't know what to do with it. How funny would it be if Ngannou just didn't expect it and had never trained single leg defense? <laughs> like He just instantly gets taken down by him. The thing is, is I do think that Alistair Overeem tried a single early in their fight. I think that's the first thing he went for in that mm-hmm. fight. And Ngannou got his hips back so fast that it just forced the fight up into a clinch immediately. And he that... And Ngannou overpowered Overeem. Yeah, and where Ngannou just looked a whole half-human bigger than Alistair Overeem in the clinch. Yeah. And that gives me real pause about Stipe Miocic's ability to just lock down Francis Ngannou in the clinch. Or to, like, or to get the single leg. Like, if, if Ngannou can just get his hips back fast enough, if he's watching for it and can get his hips back fast enough to stop a take that, to watch and to stop a single leg, then where does, where does Stipe go from there? And and the big question is too: How does he even get there? What's yeah. the what's the approach that leads Miocic into a the kind of fight where a snatch single becomes an option? Well, I mean, I, I, I it like, would be a start like uh, Overeem had, where Overeem just pressured quickly and locked, you know, locked Ngannou down in the clinch right away, and he couldn't keep it there, but that's what he had to do. And but that still may that you like that might be all Miocic needs is just to yeah. make him work really really hard as much as he can defending those things. Doesn't yeah, he, he don't need to get them at all in the early portion of the fight. So the other thing that I'm that I'm seeing that is giving me question. I don't know how it's been fixed. Is in the Lewis and Enrique fight, and you know that's how far back you have to go to see this or Enrique fight is uh, when. Um, Nganu got stuck in half guard. He did not have any solution. Yeah. Like when Henri got on top of him and had him in half guard, the ref stood them up after like 30 seconds or 20 seconds even. There it was two, two quick stand ups in that fight, if I recall. Yeah, it was a really quick stand up. And it was like, I he just looked stuck. And Stipe Miocic is very good. At working from a half guard, mm-hmm. if he get when he gets a takedown, like that is his preferred point. The other thing, though, is that if Miocic moves away from half guard, his top control is not great. Once he goes to side, once he goes to side, scramble. Yeah, he can scramble right up out from under it. So you have this like really limited idea of. I have seen faintly faint visions of Nganu defending a single leg. I have only really ever seen Stipe lately, in recent memory, hit a single leg. And I have seen Nganu be bad from half guard, and I've seen Stipe give up half guard and have somebody scramble right back out from under him. And I... I'm just going to pick on the bet that Stipe can stay safe long enough, early enough, do enough to wear Nganu down, that he can get the takedowns, and he can play a grinding fight. Maybe it'll be a kickboxing match, but I worry about how hittable Stipe is, and... I worry that he's a step slower. Like that was the big thing for me with the Overeem fight where we were talking about that is like the big reason I couldn't pick Overeem even with his new style is that he just doesn't have the speed to match Ngannou, you know? Yeah. And whereas Overeem definitely had the speed to surprise the hell out of Miocic a couple times. Yeah. So. I'm saying, man, like I totally see – yeah, people have come to me like, uh, "Oh, you picked Nganu, and you were so hyped about him on heavy hands. Nobody's giving Stipe a chance." I'm like, "I gave him a ton of chances. It's fucking heavyweight, and I don't know anything about Francis Nganu. All I know is he's exceptionally dangerous for the very wide, 
the, the, the wide slice of range that Miocic is going to have to cross to do what he usually likes to do. Yep. Uh, so I I, I'm going to pick Miocic to get it done and to find his way into takedowns, to make the clinch count in ways that Overeem couldn't, and to not get flustered and out bullied in the way that Overeem can, where it's just like, oh, I'm not losing, I, I, I'm being bullied, and now I have to really be desperate because mm -hmm. bullying, my bullying is not working. Like, I, I can see how Overeem, you know, he like, he went for the clinch, got out muscled in the clinch, and it's just like, well, shit, I gotta, th I gotta start throwing hands now because all of my good game plan is like, I am no longer able to be physically dominant. I think Miocic can ride that better, but. I don't do it confidently, so I'm not I'm picking, picking Ngannou confidently either. I just pick him excitedly, and I just yeah. can't wait to find out the answers to all of these many, many questions I have. All right. On that note, we're gonna here are the odds. Francis Ngannou is the favorite at the moment. Opened at minus one sixty, uh, adjusted to about minus one fifty five, and is now at minus one eighty one, and Miocic opened at plus 130, adjusted to about plus 140 or so, and is now at plus 150. So, I mean, it's heavyweight, so don't bet on it. But, like, yeah, there's no real reason for Nganu to be a heavy favorite. No, there's no reason for him to be a heavy favorite at all, other than terror the terror <laughs> of odds makers and betters around the world. Yeah. It's it's a hell of a fight. It's a fascinating fight. And I'm really like there are so many unanswered questions about Nganu. And he is such a ridiculously obviously uh, talented athletic specimen that it's hard to know like how how much adjusting can he do on the fly or how much is he ready for? Because it may be everything. And it may be nothing, you yeah. know? <laughs> it may be nothing. Whew. All right. On that note, you can find me on Twitter at Zane Simon. You can find uh, Connor on Twitter at Boxing Bush. That's B-U-S-C-H. You can find both of us over at BloodyElbow.com. And uh, give this video a like over on YouTube where you're watching it down there. That helps us a ton. And subscribe to our YouTube channel, MMANation.com, D-O-T-C-O-M, all spelled out. That's where you get all the latest Buddy Elbow shows, videos, interviews, analysis, all the stuff we do week in, week out. We will be back next week for UFC. Uh, UFC on Fox, Jacare versus Brunson 2. Are you excited about that main event? <laughs> Boy, what a... What a just, just having spent so much time talking about how, how excited I am for this main event... Don't tell me that next week is Jacare Brunson too. <laughs> Don't tell we'll be me doing that. Our best with that one. Until then, everyone, we will see you next time. Thank you. <laughs>